Hey everybody, today's Dorico video is going to be a little bit different because we're going to be talking about Dorico for the iPad. That's right, you can actually run a full version of Dorico on your tablet. And that means you can take your score writing, transposing, and part creation on the go with you. Now, I know a lot of us probably got our iPads thinking it was going to be this great portable computer. And in a lot of ways, it never quite panned out, right? For me, I use my iPad for two main purposes. One is I use it as a sheet music reader so that when I'm at a gig, I don't have to bring with me pounds and pounds of paper. And the other one is watching movies. And then that's about it. They, you know, I can't really do audio recording on my iPad, even though I do have the highest end M4 um, iPad. It's still just not quite up to snuff. There's not quite enough uh, hardware support for it. And the file system is a little complicated to deal with. But after I made the switch to Dorico, I realized that the iPad version of Dorico is so full featured that I could actually do so much in the iPad version that I could literally be creating parts at a gig on a set break so that by the time the band took the stage again, I could send out parts to the other iPads on stage and we could play new music. Or if a singer calls up a tune that I've already had notated, I could transpose it on the fly and so many more things. And it's actually a really powerful tool. So if you do have a more modern iPad that will run the uh, Dorico version, I think it's a really great tool. And if you're willing to spend $600 on the PC software for Dorico, the small pittance that you're going to pay for the iPad version really won't sting that hard if you're going to be able to utilize it, especially when you're on the go, on the bandstand, and so here we go with a quick overview of Dorico for the iPad. Okay, so I've fired up Dorico here on my iPad. And you'll see that you're met with a very familiar looking uh, loading screen here. You have all the documents you've opened recently. You have the ability to create a new document using the same predefined templates that we find in the full version of Dorico, as well as the learn tab. If you're going to be looking up videos outside of my channel, of course, and you have all of this at your fingertips and it'll take nothing more than a mouse click. You'll also notice that on the very bottom there, you can open and import files, which which this is actually great because I keep all of my Dorico files on Dropbox. And so if you sign into Dropbox on the uh, app on your iPad, you can literally get to all of your files on the go. Now my iPad is cell phone connected so I can actually have data wherever I go. So that means no matter where I'm at at the gig, I can always get to my Dorico files, which is incredibly handy. So you can see I've been opening up charts and making modifications on the fly here. And I'm not afraid to tell you, I've literally opened up documents and uh, edited them, entered them, done all this stuff on the fly at a gig, and it's actually relatively quick and easy. So let me open up some files here and I'll show you a little bit about how to use Dorico for iPad. Now again, you could go into the create a new and we could start from a template, but for this demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and open up a uh, file that I've already been working on. Now you can see the load time on the iPad is really pretty darn fast. It really doesn't take any appreciable amount of time. And things like scrolling and selecting is quite snappy on the iPad. Zooming in, zooming out, all of these things work really, really well. Now again, I do have the highest end iPad, and so I've got all the extra memory and everything else, which does make it a little bit easier when it comes to um, these kind of things. But in all seriousness, like I said, the app is really well optimized for the iPad. So as you might imagine, simple things like clicking and highlighting can be done with just your finger. It'll allow you to highlight single notes, as well as uh, text blocks, chords, um, and anything else that you would normally click on with your mouse in Dorico. You also have your familiar palettes over on the left side for clefs, key signatures, time signatures, 
tempo markings, dynamics, trills, you name it, it's pretty much all here. And when I've had to go find them, I really haven't thought to myself, man, I, I can't find anything, there's not there. It looks so much like the desktop version that I really do feel like I, everything is at my fingertips. And so you even have access to your um, properties pane on the bottom there where you can select a note and see all the different types of edits that you can create for this note. So there are a couple of things that are worth noting when it comes to Dorico for the iPad in terms of things that are a little bit different than the desktop version. The first thing you'll notice is the document does change when I orient the iPad either uh, in the portrait mode or landscape. And when you put it into the landscape mode, it looks a little more familiar than when we have it in the portrait mode, but I still think that 90% of what we're looking for is there. A couple of the things you might be looking for are actually uh, moved around just a little bit. For example, the little eyeball that gives us the options for concert pitch, page view, galley view, fill view, and so on. Those were all separate buttons on the bottom, but here in Dorico for iPad, we're gonna click on the little eyeball icon, and that brings up the window so that we can see all of the different options that we have for concert pitch, transposed, page view, galley view, and so on. The next thing you're gonna see here is actually a couple of buttons on the top of the menu bar here. One of them looks like the little gauge with the notes, and that button brings up the menu to let you choose what the grid it will snap to. In this case, I have it set to eighth notes, but if I need 16th notes, dotted eighth notes, and so on and so forth. Now you'll see that it's a little bit limited compared to the desktop version, but I rarely notate things in 64th notes, so it's generally okay as far as I'm concerned. The other thing that you're gonna see is these two boxes that look like the squares with the dashes around them, and these are our abilities to select things with the marquee or drawing a box around things. So the first thing we can do here is if we wanna select a number of measures, if I click on the first item, and then I click on the box there with the right arrow next to it, I can then click on something farther down the page and it will select everything up to that point. And so this is how we get around on the iPad of selecting a large group of things like say four or five different notes, as well as doing it in multiple staves and parts. And you can see again, as I click farther down the page, that's how that works. The other box there, is the marquee tool, which works like holding down the command key or control key on the windows, where I can just select items one at a time. And so if I'm building a very custom selection, that's how I'm going to do it. And so without those buttons, it would be really hard to select the notes on the iPad. So when you first start working in Dorico for the iPad, you'll notice that it takes a little bit of extra getting used to because there's these extra clicks you have to do. But once you get used to it, it goes by pretty quickly. We also have access to our note entry tools, but when we go into our note entry tool, um, we're presented with some further options for how to get around. You'll see that there's some arrows um, up there next to the buttons I was just referencing, and those arrows allow us to move through the measure just like the arrow keys would on our keyboard, and then the up and down arrows allow us to choose which part of the stave we wanna do. We also have some tools there for undo and delete, which are this little trash can and the little circles there, as well as we have some copy and paste functionality. And again, they just gave it to us in button form because we don't have the edit menu like we would on a normal Mac or on a PC. Beyond that, the note entry works pretty much the same. Um, what I find on the iPad though, is if I go in, what I like to do is I like to bring up the virtual keyboard and then I can go ahead and I can mouse over to where I want to start, say beat two. And if I wanted to enter an E here, I would choose my note length of a quarter note and then I can hit my keyboard and it'll add it in. You'll also see that it brings up this little gray bar on the side that we can actually move around if it's in our way. It gives us access to some of the keyboard shortcuts we normally use in Dorico, like moving a pitch up and down 
or sliding a pitch to the left or the right in the beat or making it longer or shorter. And so all of those option arrow commands that we use in the, on the Mac in Dorico, that's what this little gray bar represents. There's a little button there to transpose it up an octave as well as um, moving it chromatically. And so we can turn uh, uh, move it up by a half step, and then again, see if I do that, I can move it up or down by an octave. And so that's what those features represent. Most of the other tools in Dorico are pretty straightforward. If I wanted to put in a dynamic, say, if I zoomed in here and clicked on that one note, I could go to my dynamic palette, and I could put in the dynamic I'm looking for. And I could highlight several notes at a time, and then enter one dynamic, and you can see it'll enter it for me. So it's pretty straightforward. There's again less of the use of the keyboard shortcuts that we might use on the full version. We're going to be picking them with our finger or with, if you have a trackpad, you could do that as well. If you do have your uh, iPad hooked up to a keyboard, it will accept a certain number of the keyboard shortcuts from the keyboard, much like you would do on your MacBook, for example, but not all of them are available. Once you've gotten all of your notes entered and everything's looking uh, fantastic, we do have the same engrave mode that we would on the desktop, and it has pretty much all the features that we're looking for. Now, it does not do slices, so you can't make graphic um, slices out of here. You'd have to make a screenshot if you want to do that. But when it comes to simply moving around measures, notes, and then aligning the number of staves per line and things like that, we have, again, that full access like we would on the desktop version. We also, believe it or not, have access to the play menu, and the Dorico sounds on the iPad are actually pretty good. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure you could get away with loading your favorite Berlin Orchestra string sounds on the iPad, but it is nice to know that there is decent playback, and it's fully compatible with the kind of playback templates you're going to have on your desktop version, which is nice to know that if you open up a score on the fly, you're going to be able to get to it, hear it, playback, all of those wonderful things. Now, this menu, again, looks very, very similar to what you have on the uh, desktop version. You have the mixer console on the bottom with your faders. You have access to the piano rolls, as well as audio units and other things that you can edit if you had them loaded up in your project. So it's pretty darn full featured. Now, one thing that's a little different here in the Dorico version is if you want to print, for example, we don't get the same print menu that we normally have. We actually have to hit the little up arrow for share, and it gives you some options. You can export audio in both WAV and M4A. We can export MIDI, Music XML. We can do uh, PDF, we can print, or we can save it as a new Dorico project. So we do have a lot of ability up there, but it's just not quite the same. So if we click on the print interface, what it's going to do is it's going to print whatever part we have currently viewing on the screen, and it's going to bring up the air print um, options. And so if you don't have an air print compatible printer like I do, you won't have any options for printing. Now, it's a little limited here on the print options, but, you know, if you really just needed to print a part real quickly, it is plenty feature-rich enough, especially if you've done all the page formatting on your desktop version and you just need to whip out a quick print for somebody. The PDF version, again, it's just going to create a PDF of whatever you're viewing currently, so it's not going to do a batch export like it can on the desktop version, but again, on, it's pretty darn efficient realistically, and what it's going to do is it's going to give you an option for what you want to do with it. You can save it to files, I could save it to Dropbox, or I could import it directly into Fourscore if I was going to be reading it at a gig. So again, it's really pretty darn full featured, but you just have to be ready for that. Beyond that, we do have a really pretty feature-rich version of um, settings here. 
that mimic both your system settings as well as your engrave settings, layout settings, notation settings, and they're all found under the three-lined menu here in Dorico. So you can go into your project info, which you had on the desktop version. You can also choose music styles and you can edit your font styles. There's also your paragraph and character styles. Here's your notation options with all of the different things that you found on the full desktop version. And I've gone through many of these menus, and I'll be honest with you, I really haven't found a whole lot that isn't there. Um, it's really one of those things where I probably wouldn't even worry about it too much. Um, we also have our chord symbol options here. You can also see there's the layout options uh, that looks basically the same as it does in the full version. Um, but again, you're going to be missing out on just a couple of those um, features that you have on the desktop version. Because as you can see, there is no actual engrave menu there. But most of those features that you need are going to be found here in the document, either pre-saved because you made it on your desktop and opened it, or it's going to use the Dorico defaults for you. There's also the preferences where you can enter in information like what the colors are, general file saving and view saving, key commands, music XML editing, note editing, and all of these other features that we have on the desktop version. You can also see there's the reset sounds, and basically all that's gonna do is it's gonna put your sounds back to default. Now again, the Dorico for iPad basically just runs on whatever default sounds come with the software. And so you're gonna be a little bit limited on your playback. But again, I think the playback sounds are pretty darn good. And so for something that I could literally be doing at a set break while I'm on the stage and somebody's talking, that's a pretty amazing feature set. There is also access to the jump menu, which is the little jumping foot there. So if you're used to using the jump menu for different commands, it's right there for you. As well as, again, you have options for things like copy and paste. So if I select a number of notes, you'll see there is the two pages, that's the copy command, and the one next to it is the paste command. And then we also have the cut command if you wanna just delete something. And so again, there's not a lot you can't find here on the iPad version for Dorico. So I hope this was helpful as kind of a quick overview of what you can do in Dorico for iPad. Thanks so much for watching and checking out all my videos. I hope you're enjoying them on the channel and please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. I'm still searching for that last hundred subscribers so I can get all the way up to 10,000. Y'all have been great. I love the comments and questions, so keep them up, and I'll talk to you next time.